Hi, I'm Kim Stevens, and I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership for Water Sustainability in British Columbia. Hello, I'm Paul Chapman, the Executive Director of the Nanaimo and Area Land Trust and the Chair of the Watershed Moments Symposia Series. Since 2017, the Watershed Moments team has been working to share water stewardship in a changing climate stories from various communities on Vancouver Island, but relevant on a provincial scale. We began with the first symposium in Nanaimo in 2018, Parksville in 2019, and then with the onset of COVID, we adapted to online delivery of stewardship seminars. From every event in the feedback from attendees, there was a common question, where are the indigenous voices at this symposium or at that seminar? We knew we were missing the experiences of the longest and most successful stewards of the watersheds. When Indigenous scholar Michael Blackstock joined the team, that changed everything, and changed it profoundly. To provide overarching context for the conversation that will follow, respected Gitsan hereditary chief Hanamuk opens the seminar. He explains the Indigenous perspective on each generation taking responsibility for care of the land and passing that responsibility on. The Indigenous message is that health and wellness of people is directly connected to the land and water where they live. This is place-based experiential knowledge gathered and tested over millennia. The partnership's working relationship with Indigenous scholar Michael Blackstock goes back to 2016. That's when we committed to mainstreaming Michael's blue ecology philosophy in the local government setting. Blue ecology is a water-first approach to interweaving Indigenous knowledge and Western science. Michael's work is recognized by the United Nations, and that is an important part of his credibility. We see blue ecology as a pathway to water reconciliation and resilience at the local scale, because that's the scale where actions matter. The partnership is excited that Michael is taking his innovation to another level with the founding of the Blue Ecology Institute. Blue Ecology offers local government, a foundation, and a starting point that has both Indigenous and non-Indigenous buy-in. Michael believes this will remove some of the fear that characterizes our relationships with First Nations people. We are afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing. Once we get past the fear, we can move towards the hope spectrum that more easily and creatively in the seminar, you will hear Michael Blackstock in conversation with Brian Carruthers and Richard Bowes, both of whom came out of the world of local government. They discuss what blue ecology could look like at the regional and municipal scales. We can learn from indigenous peoples, and that is where Michael's concept of interweaving comes into play to find the right balance. Going forward, we are working to expand the voices included in sharing water stewardship successes and challenges. We are working to combine the connection of in-person meetings with the reach of online events at both the symposium and seminar scale. Now, please enjoy the Blue Ecology Seminar, a pathway to water reconciliation and resilience at the local scale. Welcome to the fifth session of the Watershed Moments Symposia Series. My name is Richard Bose, and I would like to respectfully acknowledge the uh, original peoples of these lands and waters in which I'm honored to be able to bring you this session, the uh, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish and Musqueam nations on whose unceded lands I'm uh, privileged to be able to, to bring you what is going to be a very interesting and inspiring session. I'm coming to you with a little bit of uh, background in local government. I've been in water resources and local government watershed planning for almost 30 years now. Uh, I can't tell you how inspired I am uh, with both of tonight's uh, guests and the material we're gonna be talking a little bit tonight. I really see the blue ecology and what we're gonna be talking about today as, as an inspiration for myself and my career and where I'm at. And I hope you'll enjoy our, our journey of inspiration that we're gonna be carrying on with tonight. The first person I'd like to introduce is we're gonna be hearing from Hanamuk 
a hereditary chief of the Gitzeskan clan. And Hanukmuk is going to be talking through a video tonight to us on the cultural significance of a term that they use, and you'll hear him in his in his presentation, Gwetz um, Elient, which roughly translated by by ourselves means the the provision or the uh, security of leaving the land better and able to sustain those that come after us. And we'll hear we'll hear Chief Hanamuk talk very clearly in terms of how this relates to his background and how important it is to the people of his, of his clan in their uh, traditional role of, of looking after and nurturing the land that sustains them. Uh, we'll hear Chief Hanamuk talk about how blue ecology fits into uh, this traditional role and, um, and guidance that the, the clan feels in terms of providing for the future generations in nurturing of the land. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit tonight around uh, the blue ecology theme. We'll talk with the, uh, the founder and architect of the blue ecology uh, framework. And when we're going to also talk with someone who's, who's been a, a pioneer and a leader in terms of, of thinking slightly outside the box when it comes to generating watershed plans. So without uh, without any further ado, I think we'll uh, we're ready to watch Chief Hanamuk and his presentation. Hello, my name is uh, Hannah Mook. I'm a hereditary chief from the northern part of BC. Um, my uh, wilt name that I'm responsible for is Geta Mahmare, which means a rainbow person. Uh, we belong to the Giscas tribe or the clan. That's the fireweed clan. Uh, our job uh, as chiefs is to take care of the members of the WILP and the land base that we have. Um, the concept of that responsibility is found in the word Gulhyez, which means leaving things for the future generations. And uh, that is the uh, ethic that we need to uh, uphold. And uh, we have based that experience on what we've been doing since the last glaciation period, some 15,000 years of experience. And uh, the work that we're doing with respect to the, the soil and the water and all of the plants and uh, ecosystems on our land is basically what we're trying to do. So we take that science and we meld it and weave it in with the Western science. And then we uh, look at how those two systems can coexist. And uh, we look to places like uh, Blue Ecology to assist us in terms of making that, uh, that work for us. The work that we do as a, as a house is to deal with the concept that's in our laws. It's uh, leaving something for the future generations. So it's got to be a functioning house, it's got to be a functioning land base. And uh, it's about our experience in terms of dealing with the last glaciation period. You will see the oral histories connect us uh, coming back to the territory and then the experience of taking 
uh, our house through all of what has taken place in the last, say, 15,000 years. And uh, the work involves the science that we have, we call it Gixan science, and how we take that information and, and weave it in with the Western science, because we believe that the two systems can coexist and bring uh, the two together to function. That's how we uh, think that the work with blue ecology is uh, the place to, to go to, to help us do that. We come from a long experience of being on our territory for thousands of years. If you listen to the oral histories, you'll see that our experience in the glaciation period and the aftermath of it is our basic knowledge of the territory and the ethic of the legal system, the law that we have, the, the traditions that we have uh, dictates to us that we have to leave something for the next generations. In our language, that concept is you have to leave it for the, the future generations. It's got to be a functioning house group. It's got to be a functioning landscape for, for people from, from the house. That is where we come from. And we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have in terms of our will is the ancient village site uh, that we come from. And it's uh, called Enwalos, means where you dig for medicine. So what we're seeing is the, the development of, of the uh, forested landscape uh, garden concept and the development of soils and the different uh, medicinal uh, plants that we have on, on our territory. The issue of water and soil then are really important. And this is how we connect up with uh, the work that's going on with blue ecology. We believe that we can do different things with respect to um, the, the water and soil. Uh, using the, the science that we come from, the Gixan science, I call it Gixan science, and Western science, uh, they have to coexist, and we, you're able to weave those two systems to accomplish what I think that blue ecology can do. Very inspiring, I find. So before I introduce uh, our next our next guest and um, sort of visitor that we'll be talking with, I want to relate a little bit of my own sort of blue ecology experience. One of the things I try to do is as often as I can is is connect with the younger the younger generation, the the new young people that might be emerging out of universities, out of our communities, and taking a role in in terms of our watershed stewardship. So, Last week, I was sitting on the side of the trail waiting to uh, take part in a tour. I had uh, arranged a tour with um, a colleague and acquaintance of mine at BCIT who was bringing their fourth year engineering students out to talk to me specifically about managing runoff and, and creating natural systems. And as I was waiting to uh, take part in this field trip and, you know, outdoor lecture, uh, I happened upon uh, an elder. And the, the elder was, was very carefully picking cedar fronds uh, from a cedar tree where the boughs were hanging over the trail where I was standing. And we started a conversation up and I inquired, I said, you know, I've, I've got to ask, you know, um, what, what use are, are you making with these cedar fronds? And, and he said to me, he says, well, the, the cedar in our culture is the tree of life. And it's, an, it's a very revered tree because of everything that this tree represents to us is life. We, we use every single piece of this tree in terms of our culture for healing, for uh, decoration, for art, for ceremony and all of these. And he was collecting these fronds 
that he uses in, in healing ceremony. And he was taking these fronds and going back to visit people he knew uh, who were sick and ill, and he was going to engage in this uh, cer healing ceremony and ritual. Uh, really, really profound. And, and, and literally 10 minutes later, here I am talking to probably over 30 young students, and we're talking about a project in which we're hoping to get a wetland uh, created and redirect some uh, water that's coming out of a storm outfall system. And and all of a sudden, it just it just dawned on me. And I asked the question, I said to the students, I said, if we were able to, to redirect this runoff away from directly going into this creek and create a little wetland series along this the side of the floodplain, what do you think might happen? And we got all kinds of answers around, well, there would be, um, you would slow the flow down. There would be infiltration of water and, and and it just, it dawned on me that, that this is a little bit about what blue ecology is, is looking to instill upon the people that have a role in looking at water. I, I, and I had to say to everyone, I said, well, what's gonna happen is if we redirect this water into this wetland, life is going to happen and life is going to create itself simply by the act of putting this water into this environment and letting it interact with the soil, the plants and everything around it, it will create life with little or no help from from us. So, um, it was a it was a very uh, incredible moment for myself. Just last week, you know, knowing that I have this blue ecology session coming up, it, it was just amazing for me. So, our next speaker I'm going to introduce is Michael Blackstock. Michael's uh, traditional name is Ama Gahodam Get, and Michael is. Uh, is an indigenous scholar. You saw some of his fabulous artwork that Hannah uh, featured in his presentation. Michael's the author and the architect of the Blue Ecology and the Blue Ecology Institute. Michael's deep connection with his own culture combined with his uh, you know, lengthy career has led him to this place where he's, he's visualized this path forward for, for both Western culture and indigenous knowledge can be woven together to create a new, a new ethic for the land and the water and the way it's managed. And again, with the, the purpose of sustaining those who will come after us. And so we're going we're gonna to hear from Michael Blackstock. I believe Michael's got a, uh, a little presentation that he's going to run through with us. And uh, introduce us a little bit to uh, the blue ecology and the blue ecology framework. Thank you, Richard. I'm going to uh, do a get sound introduction uh, to welcome you and to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the as a visitor of, in, in the late Latin territory near Prince George. And I'm also going to uh, use an expression, a get sound expression around sensing the spirit of nature uh, as a closing Gitsan phrase. So, Amasa Singigat Sigamanak, Kanal Gouba, Wisik Toyosik Nisam, Late Latin, Lo Am Gaudi, Wilma Anuk Dim Watuk Dim Leswik Willa. Ox Luam Goora Naglech Hamia Simogat Hanamuk. Thank you, Don Ryan, for his wisdom and support that he lent us today. I'm going to give you a uh, short presentation about the concept of blue ecology and close with an introduction to the Blue Ecology Institute Foundation. And then I'll turn it back over to Richard. I'm a member of the Gitsan Nation, and we're known as the people of the River of Mist, where the Skeena River and Balkley River meet. That's one of our villages, the Hazelton villages. And there's a uh, Kassan uh, School of Art right at the junction of these two rivers of mists. 
Uh, my uh, uncle, uh, Walter Harris, was one of the co-founding people of this school of art that reintroduced our beautiful art form uh, to the youth. And when I speak about the Blue Ecology Institute, one of our goals is to inspire the youth of today. So this is a multi-generational effort and education is very important to the Gitsan people. You'll see a phrase right below the photo of the Skeena River there uh, by one of our matriarch chiefs describing how water is the lifeblood of our nation. So that'll be one of the themes of this presentation. So this short presentation will start with acknowledging the elders. The elders, like Hanamuk, and I'll introduce you to the elders that I've worked with in my research to explore the meaning of water from the indigenous perspective and then compare it to the Western science perspective on water and what can be learned from that comparison. And out of that comes the blue ecology vision and the hope for attitudinal change from that vision. One of the goals today is to spark inspiration at the local level, at the local government level. I'll talk about why I see hope at the local level and I hope to spark inspiration for local government, indigenous government and, and uh, regional districts and municipalities. And then the final thought will be uh, sharing some information about our new institute. You see before you photos of elders most have passed now, but they left their knowledge and shared their knowledge willingly because of their worries about how Earth Mother was being mistreated in their eyes by the dominant society. And they wanted to share the teachings that they learned as children with us in the hope that it would inspire change. And as I mentioned, my hope today is to inspire local government and to inspire our youth with the wisdom that they shared. So what I'm sharing with you today isn't an idea that I came up with. It's an idea that was passed on to me by these elders from different nations in British Columbia. So the research question that I, that I had for my research, which started over 20 years ago, was a simple question. What is water? And as I learned, it was deceptively simple because I, it took me 20 years and still I'm exploring this question. Uh, if you look up uh, what is the definition of water in, in the Oxford Dition Dictionary or a science textbook, even in grade five, six, seven levels of curriculum, they'll talk about it as a chemical compound. Um, and if I compare that to the definition in the other bubble that uh, was developed when I was on a UNESCO expert advisory uh, committee set up uh, with indigenous membership. The United Nations had asked this expert advisory council to come up with a different definition that showed respect to the indigenous perspective uh, and that they would use this definition to form water policy going forward. So you know, water is the essential life blood of our planet, which has the power to give and take life. Um, it's a very different definition than the one you would typically see in a grade five, six, seven textbook, scientific textbook, for instance. My research is ethical based. It's based on the same principles that you would find in university uh, level um, uh, research where there's ethical guidelines and uh, permission is granted and sought by the interviewees, elders in this case. Uh, my research is peer reviewed both by the typical journal uh, uh, editorial boards that you would normally uh, be uh, peer reviewed when you're doing research, but I also go to another level of peer review and that is with the communities, the Indigenous communities. They have a chance to look at my research as well. So. The research that I'm sharing with you uh, has been double peer reviewed and published in numerous uh, journals, including 
the International Association of Hydrologic Science Red Book Series, which is a tier one journal on the topic of water. In my research, as I mentioned, I compared the indigenous perspective on water to the Western science one and quickly saw some key differences. The one that I'll emphasize is that water is seen as having a spirit as as giving life as the life blood of our planet from an indigenous perspective whereas in western science is seen as non-living or abiotic that, that serves the living community it's seen as a physical material that assists living organisms rather than being living itself and this foundational difference affects our attitudes towards water and nature the other key difference that I saw that is uh, in Western science, it's, it's uh, seen as in a hierarchical system that we're known as the animal kingdom and how that kingdom is, is uh, classified and you won't find water in there because it's seen as non-living. So it's a very kind of taxonomic uh, perspective, whereas in indigenous perspective, it's a relationship based perspective on water. Water has the ability to unify all life because it connects all parts of nature to other parts of nature. So it has a very important relationship uh, level role in our world. Uh, elders will talk about water as a central value and that the heart of an ecosystem is the water, the life blood of the ecosystem pumping through the nature's world. So imagine looking at a forest and water is being pumped like blood in a heart through all the plants and beings connecting in re a relationship means toward to all beings in, in the forest. So very much a relationship focus, whereas in Western science, it's very taxonomic and, and narrowing uh, sort of a chemical uh, perspective. So from this comparison, the elders encouraged me to use the knowledge that they shared about water to create a hopeful vision, an inspiring vision for not only indigenous youth, but non-indigenous youth and, and all people in general that can rally upon uh, by interweaving the strengths of Indigenous knowledge with Western science. So the Blue Ecology Vision encourages a collaboration. It's not a competition between whether Indigenous wisdom is better or Western science is better. The notion here is that they're better together. And so this vision, uh, as you see on the screen, the overall ar overarching goal is that we encourage sustainable survival, which means survival with dignity. And Hanamuk talked in the video about the role of a chief of a wilp, that their role is to sustain their people, the members of the house, but also the land they live upon because we're borrowing the land from future generations. We're borrowing water from future generations. So the vision is an ecological philosophy which emerged from in interweaving indigenous and Western thought that acknowledges water's essential rhythmical life spirit. And that's key there where we're acknowledging that water has a spirit and its central functional role in generating, sustaining and receiving and ultimately unifying life on earth. From this vision, it implies a water first task when we're doing environmental planning or development. The, the first thing we ask is how will this mine or forest harvesting or real estate development affect water? Because water connects all of nature together. So that was the vision that came from my research the process in which this blue ecology vision was developed was is called interweaving and it's also the means with which we see collaboration at the local level where local governments indigenous and non-indigenous can collaborate 
in a way that acknowledges the strengths of both knowledge systems as coexisting threads to produce a new cooperative theory called blue ecology. Coexisting knowledge systems working in tandem and in balance. So the indigenous ways of knowing are kept whole and science is kept whole, but the bridge between them is blue ecology. The guiding principles of blue ecology were encouraging to move from the view of just water to all of nature. These principles apply to all of nature and the way we our relationships towards nature. So it's five guiding principles of blue ecology in the acronym SHRUB are spirit, harmony, respect, unity, and balance. So blue ecology emerged from the study of water, but applies to all of nature. And we encourage uh, that we view our relationship with nature through these five principles that nature, or that we want to sense the spirit of nature, uh, that we live in harmony with nature, that we respect nature, that we acknowledge that nature unifies all beings and all beings are equal with, underneath that and that we seek balance, that we give back to nature as much as we, as we use, for example, that we give back to future generations, the land and water that we're using in as good or better condition that we receive it. So these principles guide our overall approach to and attitudes towards nature. So changing attitudes, this is the hope that the, uh, the elders had. This is the, the challenge that they laid before me. This is the inspiration I hope to, to inspire within you at the local levels, is a change in attitude. An attitude is simply defined as a collection of values, theories, philosophies, beliefs, and principles that motivates and influences our behavior. And the good news here is that it costs nothing to change our attitude. Often we'll hear the, about the mammoth challenges before us and environmental challenges and shifting industry and companies from their current way of doing things to a more balanced shrub oriented blue ecology approach about how much it will cost and how long it will take. But the first step is free. It costs nothing. It costs nothing to change our attitude. And that's the good news. For example, it costs us nothing to change our attitude from seeing nature as a means, as a servant to humans, to the blue ecology or indigenous perspective of sensing the spirit of nature. So making that shift in attitude shifts our behavior and our relationship towards nature and it costs nothing. It's simply a switch in our attitude. Another switch we can do is change the way we view climate change. One of the dominant perspectives or dominant messages around climate change is the focus on carbon, which is true. Uh, methane is also true. There are some of the, the activators or triggers of climate change but really understanding what's going on when the climate is changing from a blue ecology perspective, we're encouraging you to look at climate change as the acceleration of the transformation of water. Water comes in, as you know, in the, in, in, uh, the water cycle, in the Western science water cycle, it comes in either vapor, solid or liquid. So it's transforming, for example, from ice by evaporating into a vapor or melting into water, that transformation is accelerating because of climate change. So if we look at it through that lens, as well as the carbon lens, that will help us understand what's going on and help us change our attitude. So our climate change attitude, rather than relying on a global solution solely looking at carbon and methane, let's make a switch to a grassroots, individual, local attitudinal change by looking and understanding at, about climate change from a water perspective or 
a blue ecology perspective and our relationship with nature and then changing our attitudes towards nature, making that switch, which will then help us understand climate change and introduce new ideas and inspiration on how to deal with it. Also, my goal of, of sparking inspiration with, with the audience tonight that's, that has an interest in local government is the principle of subsidiarity. Blue Ecology is a framework for local government to customize based on the unique local biocultural diversity of the area. What individuals can accomplish by their own initiative and efforts should not be taken from them by a higher authority. In British Columbia, we have a municipal governance system and also an Indigenous governance system that allows us to focus at the local level. In Hanamuk, described the Gitsan Wilp governance system that where the chief of the house group or in the area that they're responsible for or caretaking is a local sort of delegation of authority. You know, British Columbia, our municipal governments also have delegations of authority at the municipality and regional district levels. So the tools are there for indigenous people to work together with regional districts and, and local government. And that we can inspire and educate the youth at the local level to take on either stream as stream keepers or ambassadors for encouraging change in businesses and companies, encourage our conscious consumerism approach at the local level, you know, the hundred mile diet where youth can encourage sustainable consumption at their local level and people understand their local watersheds and local biocultural diversity best because they live there and and that's a key concept indigenous people have lived here for thousands of years and have a wealth of knowledge to offer and so through interweaving and collaboration the principle of sub subsidiarity can be embraced by local leadership and I hope that today's discussion will help you inspire you. Often I get questions when I make the Blue Ecology press presentation is what can I do as an individual? Because it's daunting and, and, and frankly some people feel hopeless and what worries me is that our youth feel hopeless by the daunting challenges of the climate change crisis. So. I hope to offer some simple things that people can do at the local level as individuals and collaborating with each other. The first and most important one is to sense the spirit, to sense the spirit of nature around you, to go to nature. For example, one of the uh, sort of um, ceremonies that many indigenous nations have is called going to the water. And in Gitan, we call this satwuch, which is the conscious decision each day to, have, to acknowledge the ceremonial relationship between us and nature. I used the phrase in my introduction, loom goura naglech, which means nature brings joy to me, which, which is acknowledging the spirit of nature. That's the first thing, the attitudinal shift as an individual. Also, we encourage people to, to adopt the blue ecology principles and to adopt within those principles an ethic called giving back. We're borrowing land and water from future generations, which means we got to give it back in better or the same condition as we received it. And we also to start thinking about climate change through the blue ecology lens, to think about the role of water and how our attitude towards nature affects climate change. If we see nature as something that serves us, that's inanimate, that was meant to serve humans, that is one attitude. Another attitude is the one the indigenous nations have is that Earth Mother has given us gifts that we must respect and through ceremony acknowledge these gifts and through our behavior give back the gifts and take care of the land so these are a few things that we can do to move from what 
called sustainable development, which I see basically as an oxymoron, but development is not infinitely sustainable because the, as the population grows and, and we overconsume um, through, through one of the human nature's flaws of greed, keep consuming, then we are faced with a tragic end as a human race, I think. We need to shift from that to sustainable survival with dignity. And that's, that's what the hope is. So those are some things that, can, that we can do. I'm one of the co-founders of a new uh, institute called the Blue Ecology Institute Foundation. And we hope to, by, through the use of the principles of blue ecology, to inspire youth ambassadors and address climate change by inspiring a new attitudinal shift towards how we re relate to nature and thereby address and embrace a new conscious consumerism whereby as individuals we affect change globally by the decisions we make and can in consumption. So this institute is, has, is a nonprofit charity that's been established in Canada. Uh, the policies have been written and the launch, the public launch of this institute is, uh, the planning and development of that is well underway. We take a partnership approach and that's why working with the, uh, the Partnership for Water Sustainability in British Columbia and also the Canadian United Nations University rep, uh, Bob Stanford has been one of our, uh, uh, the people that we mentors of, of ours. So the Blue Ecology Institute Foundation uh, is going to focus on youth and also our scope of, uh, initial scope in the launch is, is British Columbia. So uh, stay tuned for that. So Hamiya, thank you for for listening and uh, I'll turn it back over to Richard. Thanks, Michael. Every time I, I listen and I hear you talk about blue ecology, uh, my mind literally explodes with ideas and um, what can I do and, and how can I do things differently? So um, very, very inspiring. Our next um, guest who we're really, really lucky to have with us tonight is Brian Carruthers. Brian Carruthers comes to us after a lengthy career as a manager with BC Parks. He's a former CAO of the Cowichan Valley Regional District. And one of the reasons why we're, we're really thrilled to have Brian with us tonight is, is that he was one of the one of the real driving forces and champions behind uh, the drinking water and watershed protection program uh, that the Cowichan Valley Regional District has developed. And we're going to have the, the opportunity to have a discussion with Brian uh, about his work in the Cowichan Valley and some of the, the, the innov innovative ways and approaches he brought to the development of his, of his plan. Brian, it's great to have you join Michael and I uh, over the next sort of half hour, 40 minutes to, to have a discussion around blue ecology. So we're glad you could join us. Thank you, Richard. Pleased to be here. So we've we've heard from Michael and and uh, the blue ecology. And so what I want to do now is 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 I'd like to I'd like to recognize the effort uh, by the Cowichan Valley tribes and and the other peoples had that helped with input into this uh, drinking water and watershed protection program. Maybe in your own words, Brian, describe a little bit in terms of how you maybe in your own way embraced some of this move towards, a, say, a blue ecology way of thinking and, and just give us a little bit of insight as to, as to how that might've came about in, in, as you were developing the plan. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, uh, Michael. I was inspired coming to the uh, to the Cowichan Valley Regional District. I had been uh, uh, CAO in the Central Kootenai Regional District 
and uh, and had an opportunity to, to to move down to the Cowichan Valley. And and one of the reasons that drew me to the Cowichan was the the work that was being done by the Cowichan Valley and Cowichan Tribes uh, through the Cowichan Watershed Board and through a, a collaborative um, governance um, initiative that was. Uh, intended to, 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 it was basically blue ecology in action. It, it, was, it was local government working shoulder to shoulder with, with, with couch and tribes to attempt to tackle a, a number of really significant issues facing the, the couch and river and the, and the couch and watershed. Um, and so, you know, understanding the roles that both play and, and, and Michael, you spoke to, to the role of local government. Um, interestingly with regional districts, Regional districts have to uh, implement or, or or create a service in order to to uh, undertake activities, governance activities within their within their jurisdiction, and uh, not a lot of regional districts, up till probably the last five years, uh, were delving into the area of water stewardship. Um, it was it was seen as a as an area that was provincial jurisdiction, provincial responsibility, and and uh, very few regional districts uh, politically were interested in, in stepping into what would be deemed to be a provincial sphere of, of responsibility. And that's what inspired me to come to the couch. And when I saw uh, the, the leadership of the of tribes and the leadership of the couch and Valley Regional District wanting to take a more active role in, in watershed management uh, and watershed governance. And essentially the, the uh, the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Service was the result of a, of a number of initiatives that had happened over, over uh, the better part of probably 10 years, uh, beginning with the, uh, with the Couch and Basin um, uh, strategy and the Couch and Watershed Board that was, was developed specifically to, to um, uh, solve some of the, the significant problems facing the Couch. And uh, that had, had morphed into an initiative to look at a, a regional governance uh, model for, for water in, in the Couch and region, which arguably at its time uh, uh, appeared to be probably a little bit more ambitious than, than, the, than the region was ready for in terms of taking on that role. Um, so we, we pared that down to a more um, uh, operational uh, management type service that would basically position the regional district to be able to get involved in water stewardship and, and water management. Um, and, uh, and to pave the way for us to introduce blue ecology into our, our planning processes. Um, so it, it, I, again, I, I, I just have to say that uh, as, at a local government level, the leadership that the, the Couch and Valley showed uh, in terms of joining forces with Couch and Tribes and, and, and creating this service was, uh, was certainly inspiring for me. And, uh, and the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Service is just one legacy of that relationship. So Michael, how would you go about promoting this term biocultural diversity at a local level to, to help us make decisions about water? I think, first of all, it's recognizing the diversity of Indigenous peoples and languages in British Columbia. As a province, British Columbia has the most diverse Indigenous language groups in Canada compared to other provinces. So, first of all, we have a great wealth of diversity of Indigenous nations and Indigenous languages in, in British Columbia, which they bring to the table a wealth of knowledge. So this diversity, I think, is is a key to solving these very complex global issues because we need all different perspectives, diverse ideas brought to the table to solve problems. So we have an opportunity in British Columbia because we have this diverse culture. Also, British Columbia is has the greatest biodiversity as a province in Canada as well. We have the biogeoclimatic classification system that was developed uh, by Dr. Kraina and Klinka uh, that divides the province into these biodiversity uh, zones or biogeoclimatic zones. So we have two layers of incredible diversity that are a source of wealth for us and also of great responsibility. As Hanamuk said, we have a great responsibility to take care of the biodiversity and the cultural diversity. And that's what biocultural diversity is, this interrelationship of the cultures with the, the biodiversity. So 
you know, we have a wealth of opportunity in British Columbia. You know, Brian, again, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, I can't help but thinking that you were a little ahead of your time in that you were in your own way. You realized the importance of, of the cultural history and knowledge that the Cowichan tribes were going to bring to the watershed program. And you went out and, and you sought that kind of input. So uh, describe to me a little bit in your own way, now that you've heard a little bit of, from Michael about biocultural diversity, can you maybe describe about how your, um, your collaboration with the Cowichan tribes, the kind of value that brought in to the watershed and drinking water protection program? Yeah, and I, I would have to say that, you know, the Cowichan Valley itself is ahead of its time in terms of the collaboration that had been uh, uh, established and, 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 uh, and nurtured between Cowichan tribes and, and the regional district for a number of years. So, and again, that, that resulted in the Cowichan Watershed Board, which is co-chaired co by the, the chief of Cowichan tribes and the, and the chair of the Cowichan Valley Regional District. Um, I think the drinking water and water should Shed Protection Service simply builds on that. Um, you know, when I looked at the intent of the service, it's, it, it's really an enabling service. Uh, it's a service that positions the regional district and the region to take a more active local role in, in water stewardship, rather than relying on the province to be um, managing our resource. I think the Cowichan region has always been interested in self-determination. Uh, along with with our First Nations partners in 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 having a say in how water is managed, how water is allocated, how we care for uh, the the important watersheds in the in the region, and the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Service basically gave the regional district a mandate. Um, I call it skin in the game in terms of of, of being able to not only uh, gather information to to um, conduct studies, to do assessments. Uh, it also enabled us to embark on water sustainability plans, which we previously wouldn't have had that ability to take a, a leadership role in. And for me, that's where the weaving of, of Western science and indigenous knowledge comes together is when you actually uh, put it to play in a planning process where you can consider both of those uh, streams, pardon the pun of information, uh, to make good informed decisions. Um, and and the, the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Service, I always felt positioned the region uh, to take those things on. Um, it, there was uh, immediate expectations around what that Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Service would do for the communities and, 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 and for the region. Uh, but it's in, it was important just to establish the service so that it was there so that future leadership in the regional district and future leadership in college and tribes and, and other indigenous communities in the region had the benefit of that service to uh, actually start making some decisions on the ground around how to manage the service. Um, not to mention the, the benefits that local government, not only the regional district, but, but the municipalities um, benefited from the knowledge in terms of informing land use decisions uh, in, in the Cowichan region as well. We've got, as an example, the, the local government in which I've spent almost 30 years in, in terms of looking at our watersheds, there's, I think we, we've we got 23 or 24 different watersheds, all with some semblance of, of fish, anadromous fish populations, or, or salmon, as we say. Um, and I can't help but think, Michael, how how we've been really missing uh, a, a lot of possible opportunities in, you know, as a lot of our audience knows that local governments are required to develop what we call integrated stormwater management plans and things like that for, for the protection of our watersheds. And, and as we strive to, to complete these watershed plans, we're missing something about this local, this local biocultural knowledge and history around how how we can affect change on these local watersheds if if we're we're not tapping into that knowledge that's been present, you know, for thousands of years from people that have have gathered their living from the resources provided by these creeks. So uh, I think as as someone still in a local government uh, position in terms of managing water and watersheds, it, I really feel 
the, the need to open, open our minds, our ears, our eyes, and look at how we might take advantage and leverage some of that knowledge, right? To, to make, to help us move in, in a direction that's gonna sustain these watersheds. Um, I, frankly, I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, I've spent almost 30 years in this career and, uh, and it's, there's days where I feel I've made no progress. And, uh, and so again, I, I, speaking about, about that and, and that feeling that I've had, you talk about um, the spirit of hope and inspiration. Um, describe a little bit about that, Michael, in terms of why you, you continue to portray such a positive outlook and approach when it comes to sort of the future of our watersheds and, and our water here in the province. Yeah, thank you for the, the question, Richard. Um, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll address that, and I just wanted to let folks know if they're more curious about the concept of biocultural diversity. I wrote an article in the BC Forest Professional in 2014, and did some uh, mapping analysis and pr proposed some biocultural diversity zones for British Columbia. So if people are interested in that, so I, I'm going to start off with a story that was taught to me and, and I actually did some artwork around this story because it was so powerful and you mentioned salmon and and uh, the story I'll talk about it, it talks about salmon in our world we see them as fish uh, and some people will even call them like a, a resource or a commodity that that's there for us to harvest that's one way of looking at it but in the Gitsan uh oral history, there's a story about uh, the salmon prince, and, and I'll just do a short version of that, where one day there was a young Gitsan boy playing beside a river when when the sockeye were spawning in the, in the rivers of mist that I showed in the beginning of my presentation in the Gitsan territory. And this boy had not been taught uh, the right ways to look at nature. Uh, he had a poor attitude towards nature and he was throwing rocks at the spawning salmon and poking them with a stick as they tried to spawn. The elders watched this and were, were upset. And the chief of the salmon people swam up the river and kidnapped this young boy and took him back to his world and in his world, the salmon people transformed from what we saw as fish into salmon people. They were people in the salmon world. So the salmon prince that kidnapped this young boy who was mistreating the sockeye salmon pointed to an old lady that was walking with a cane. And he said, you did that. You poked a stick and broke her leg. And then he pointed to a blind man in the village and he said, you did that. You poked your stick into the salmon's eyes and made him blind. Those people, those are people. They are your relatives. You have mistreated them. Look what happened. He said, I'm gonna take you back to your world and I want you to share the story of this journey. And I want you to change your attitude towards how you treat nature. So we see salmon as the silvery swimming swimming people we see people we don't see well a fish we don't we don't see um these instinctual uh biological fish that somehow make their way back to spawn we see people coming back to their territory coming home from their journey in the ocean that story is very powerful and had a big impact on me and I did art around it. And these stories can change our attitudes and that's where the hope lies, your question about hope. It costs nothing to change our attitude towards nature. As, but we need to be shown how our behavior is affecting the natural world. We've been taught that, that nature's there to serve us, that that nature is a commodity or a resource, that it provides services to humans, when really we're just another being in this large web of life that's centered around the lifeblood, which is water. So my hope is that 
the youth will be able to, at no cost, change their attitudes, and that the local level will be able to change our attitudes and collaborate with each other. None of this attitudinal shift costs money, and that's why I'm so hopeful. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, we got to have that hope. What do we feel is, is the number one action that a local or, or regional government can do to meaningful support a transition toward embracing a blue ecology way of thinking? Um, so let's start with that part of the question. It's kind of a three-part question. So why don't we just have a little bit of a discussion around that? Let's start with you, Brian, given your sort of regional government experience. Number number one thing that a local government might consider doing to, to move the pendulum to embrace this kind of a, a new edict. Well, it, it for me, it always comes down to relationships. It, it comes down to establishing those connections uh, with communities, um, uh, with elders, with the leaders in, in Indigenous communities. You know, Michael talked about the stories, and I, I can't help but think of the power of stories in transforming my view of water and my view of the use of water and the importance of, of watersheds. And I think having those relationships between local government and, and, and Indigenous leaders and Indigenous communities starts to build that awareness and that understanding and, and, and develops that concept of blue ecology. So when you ask about a first step, that would be my first step. There, there are many other steps along the way, but, but it, it starts with relationships and understanding and communication. Yeah. Great answer, great idea. So I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit, Michael, and then I'm, I'd love to see what your opinion is on this. So um, we talked a little bit as we were prepping for the session about how I was involved in some training the other day. And the, the training was how how to properly collaborate and communicate um, when working on projects with um, with Indigenous uh, First Peoples. And so one of the things that I think would be most meaningful for a local government would be to try and create some internal policy around how you communicate and, and begin to establish relationships with the people who know the biocultural diversity of your watersheds the best, right? And the example I'm going to use here is, is all local governments, when we do and plan work in and about a stream, we're subject to a, a provincial process under the Water Sustainability Act. And through that process, the province reaches out to First Nations and collects feedback on the projects that this local government is planning in and about water. So one of the things that, that I would really strongly advocate is there's really nothing preventing a local government from, from approaching the First Nation who has that firsthand and traditional knowledge about that watershed. Go to them right away and say, and, and say we, we are planning to build this big infrastructure project. We're, we're doing something that may or may not impact the water. We would like to talk to you about your thoughts about it and different ways in which we can learn and add biocultural diversity into our planning and design of this project. Don't wait and, and, and follow this circular route through this uh, Water Sustainability Act process. Take some initiative, create some direction with the design people within your own government and get them reaching out. And just like Brian said, we don't start building relationships until we actually take that first moment to go knock on the door, call, or send a communication to say, hey, we would love to talk to you about this and get your knowledge on, about this project that we're doing. So that would be one way in which a local government, I think, would, would affect a pretty dramatic shift in how they do things. Uh, Michael, now let's, let's have your thoughts. Yeah, great, great ideas, you guys, Richard and Brian. I, you know, the, the relationship with the Indigenous nations is super important. And, and I think, you know, when I talk to two nations, they want a seat at the table as equals. They want, they want the opportunity to collaborate uh, with local government. Brian and Richard uh, both have a wealth of knowledge and experience 
that they can bring to the table and indigenous people do as well. So this collaboration or interweaving of equal knowledge systems to solve problems, that's the relationship side. What I what my suggestion is, is envision Nanaimo as a blue ecology city that brings hope to its citizens and will give back the land to future councils and mayors and citizens and the the Nanaimo area in as good or better condition than in, they receive it. So embracing blue ecology as a framework, being a blue ecology city that collaborates with indigenous people and, and acknowledges this relationship with nature. And at the individual level, you know, how, how would you take this first step? One of the things that we encourage at Blue Ecology Institute is to get out of the boardrooms, get out of the meeting rooms, get out into nature and have those discussions in nature to sense the spirit around you. That's a crucial first step is to have these discussions being inspired by nature. That's where the inspiration will come. So Envision Nanaimo is a blue ecology city that collaborates with Indigenous people to bring a brighter future to our youth. The point you made, Michael, and I couldn't agree more, is, is if we can take the, the knowledge and the the ability that Western science has has created and evolved to to describe a watershed in terms of physical parameters and chemical parameters and all of this, you know, lengthy litany of, of physical and, and chemical science that we've developed. It seems it seems obvious to me how how we wouldn't be in a better position to affect change when we take what we know and add the significant value to it of of the history of this particular watershed or or this place within the watershed um it, it just seems like it just seems simple and basic to me is is you know we take one and one and we make a number two and two is bigger than one right so it just to me it, it seems obvious uh brian any more thoughts about that no, other than, you know, I just reflect on my time on the couch and, and, and I feel so honored to have been a, a part of, of, of a movement, a part of, a, of, of um, you know, a, a unified effort to, to, to manage and, and, and look after the, the couch, and, uh, couch and river and the couch and basin. And, you know, I, I've, I've had the honor through my entire career of, of with, in BC Parks and, and in local government of, of, of being a steward and a, and a caretaker of, of some amazing environments and some amazing communities. But you also take things for granted and, and you know, coming to the couch and then spending time with, with leaders and elders of the, of the, the, the couch and community give me a much better understanding and appreciation for, for the river. Um, it wasn't just a river that flowed that had fish in it and that people would tube down for, for recreation. Uh, when you start appreciating the, the, the spiritual, the ceremonial, the transportation uses, the, the, the lifeblood of that river for, 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 uh, for those people, that it, it, it changes how you look at water and it changes. And, and, and I think that's that, the value of blue ecology and that's the value of local government working with indigenous communities and indigenous leaders to understand the value um, of, of those waters that they're trying to protect and, and to take a leadership role in the planning um, and, and stewardship of, of those watersheds. And again, it's not something that every local government does um, because there's costs, there's costs involved. And, and, you know, we went to the citizens of the Cowichan region uh, with a proposal to establish this service and it, it was passed, um, you know, with the majority. So it was clear that the citizens of the region felt that it was important for us to take that role uh, on, on behalf of the citizens. And uh, again, I was, I was honored to, to be able to be a part of that in the, in the Cowichan. We've got another question here that I'm, uh, I can't help but but bringing forward and and to me it speaks really clearly, uh, Michael, as to why why we need something like blue ecology to um, to build hope and and to raise raise the spirits of those who who really want and already think of water differently. We have a question here is, is around um, this person. They they almost they've sent me a question almost like they're in despair. 
uh, around, you know, they go for walks down the road or they, they walk in their trail and they're talking about the, the, the garbage that they see around the streets and the curb lines that is entering the storm drains and um, the litter in the parks and all of this. And, and this person is really, to me, they're expressing a despondency around, oh my goodness. And you spoke to this, Michael, in your presentation a little bit about this, this despair around this is such a daunting task. Now, you know, lift this person up a little bit uh, talk to her about the hope again, and and why, if and and how, by by thinking of water differently, how can we maybe raise our spirits and and see a sign of hope? Yeah, uh, it's common for me to hear that story about people's grief around what's happening mm -hmm. to our world we're in a relationship with nature and just like we're in a relationship with a family member, we're seeing the unhealthy, the sickness around us and we grieve and despair over it. So that is common and, and natural. And, and thank God we feel that way because if we didn't, you know, imagine how worse it would be. So, you know, I just acknowledge that, you know, that, that feeling is real and, and unfortunately it's more common than not. But I do have a lot of hope. Uh, the first step I, that I suggest to people is, is, there's a, is to understand why Western science and how Western science evolved from the 15th, 16th century in the age of en enlightenment. Um, how did science come to view nature as separate from, from humans? Because when we separate ourselves, man from beast, for example, um, that creates an attitude. And that attitude gets reflected in our behavior and how we treat nature. So I really recommend a book um, that's this book here. It's written by Keith Thomas, Man and the Natural World. It describes the history of our relationship with the natural world and why Western science evolved the way it did. Um, and the hope lies in indigenous uh, perspective on the reverence that the indigenous people have for nature and their practical ways of interacting with nature over thousands of years. So that knowledge is, is there and it's in equal to Western science and we need to weave those two together. And we've all that weaving and attitudinal changes it's free that's that's the beauty of all this us making different decisions as consumers it doesn't cost us anything to make those decisions yeah. so i think that's where i i get all the hope and that, that there's this vast library of knowledge out there that hasn't been tapped and it's indigenous wisdom um, and if we interweave these as coexisting um knowledge systems we're going to achieve great things we just have to spark that engine so yeah, yeah I, I do see a lot of hope and i do hear a lot of despair so michael the i think it was the acronym shrub you talked about in terms of 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 water and water management so unity balance so for water to be in in unity and in balance uh, Michael also talked about the three phases of water. One of the things that many local governments, some are already doing a, a very good job at doing it, some, some not. So when you look at the water and your watersheds and your, the health of your watersheds, you are able to look at the water from this blue ecology lens in terms of unity and balance. And one of the things that the partnership has talked a lot about is our water balance methodology. And that a lot of Western science, especially in developed areas, is focused on managing only this water that we can see. But if we can change the way of thinking to say that, no, actually water as a whole has spirit and water in this watershed needs to be managed properly needs unity. So we then need bylaws to manage 
the unity of water as it's occurring in this watershed. And that means the, the groundwater that Michael talked about. The groundwater has healing benefits and, and very important cultural significance. So local governments can adopt a blue ecology lens by looking at bylaws that, that require the management of water to be done in unity and harmony and balance. And to, and to do that, they bring the tools of Western science into it to ensure that they're actually treating the water in this watershed in, in balance, right? So, so there's one example of something that, that I've, I've thought often about. Um, the example here is, you know, single family housing development. Not a lot of attention is paid to the water that could soak into the ground, the water that could restore life to these properties. A lot of and most of the attention is paid to water that just runs off. So that's, that's kind of a framework that doesn't necessarily treat water in harmony and unity. So, you know, that's just one idea of some bylaws that could, could be contemplated that would treat water, you know, in harmony in terms of all the places where it, it resides and flows and moves through the watershed. So again, uh, a little, uh, that, that's a tough question, but it's hitting it right there in terms of where people want to go. Um, I have some ideas there, Richard, if you. Yeah, oh, go ahead, Michael, absolutely. Uh, to, to, to sort of springboard off of, uh, of what you were saying, there, there's, a, there's a leadership style uh, called prevoyance. Um, it's a it's an old French. It has French roots, and and essentially what it means is that in the face of dangerous times, we need to make decisions based on imperfect knowledge on our principles. So we're faced with this climate crisis that's that's dangerous that's accelerating accelerating faster than we can research it so we have to move away from what i call prescriptive governance writing prescriptions on how to do things like how do you do a a, a, a subdivision development how do you plan a park in your in your town you know, writing a list of things that you need people need to do we move need to shift to principle based because we won't have time to research things and so blue ecology offers the shrub principles we make decisions at the local level based on principles rather than prescriptions that's one way to one thing another example is this giving back uh, the, around the principle of balance we need to give back as much as we take from nature. So one thing that we can do is if you've got a place, say, in, in your in your municipality that's overused, a park that's overused, an area that has way too high density of new housing that just can't sustain the, the sustainable development that's going on, that we develop a, an idea that we're proposing is healing zones. This park is closed for a year because we need it to heal. We have taken, we have used, it has given us the gifts of recreation and, and, um, and peace and serenity, uh, but it has become overused. So we need to let it heal. That's a shift in thinking that I think will give people hope and, and it's an attitudinal sh shift. So this park is closed for a year to allow it to heal uh, because we've, we want to give it time. It has given us gifts, and now we need to let it rest. That's a, that's that's a suggestion from Elder Mary Thomas of the the Sequoia Nation. When we're doing environmental planning, the first test that we should ask the developer is, how is your development going to affect the quality and quantity of water in our community? If they can't answer that that gives you an immediate sense of where they're coming from because water is the lifeblood of your community. If they haven't thought about that, then, then your community is, is at risk. So that's the first test in your environmental planning when you're doing uh, a zoning, for example. The first question I would ask is, how does your development affect 
the rhythm of flow, the quality and quantity of water in our community. And I think one of the most important things you can do is celebrate nature, the sense of spirit by inspiring the youth in your community to celebrate through ceremony and acknowledging nature's role in your community on, for example, World Water Day, March 22nd. Um, that's, that's an opportunity. So those are just a few that come, come to mind for me. And I, I actually recommend a, a book, The River Why by David James Duncan, because in there he describes how he follows this river through a community, through a municipality, looking at the journey of this river through all the housing and the factories and seeing how this affects uh, the, the, this little stream is being affected. Very powerful uh, lesson for, for, you know, these tiny little streams that are in your community. Some of them disappeared, some are rerouted, some are blocked, some are polluted. Uh, just understanding what's going on in your community. Um, I, I just, I like the idea of healing zones and, and we've sort of inadvertently arrived at that, um, especially during the last few years, when a lot of our open green space literally has been loved to death. And we've had to put up exclusion fencing to, to keep people away. And inevitably that creates conflict. And what I'm now seeing is, is that we need to maybe think about how we communicate things differently. This, this is about healing the land, letting the land have time to recover because it's absolutely incredible with the growth and the vibrancy that can occur even within a year. One, when, if we let nature uh, have the time and the space to, to heal itself. The Couch of Valley uh, Regional Drink, uh, Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Program, we've, we've really just kind of focused on the Cowichan Valley tribes, but I, I take it that there were a lot, many more uh, indigenous uh, thoughts and and um, and peoples went into uh, thinking and working and developing that program. Do you have any more comment thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, the um, really where we we got really good um, uh, involvement and and input. Uh, from from other uh, indigenous communities in the region was through the uh, through the implementation strategy. Um, so as we developed the, uh, the 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 watershed service itself, um, it was pretty much led by the regional district and 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 sponsored by the, the regional district. Once the once the the uh, bylaw was adopted, uh, the board had had. Uh, asked us to go out and develop an implementation strategy to operationalize this this new service. And so th that was the point where we were able to to bring a, a variety of groups together, um, indigenous representatives, uh, stewardship groups, citizens, uh, other government agencies, to start having those conversations around what would the service actually do and what would some of the objectives be. And, and I think that was the, the, the kind of the first step in starting to look at rural ecology and, and, and indigenous knowledge. And again, as I said earlier, I think it really comes to bear when we start taking concrete action around developing management plans and management strategies where we can, where we can bring all of those pr perspectives together to make you know, really good informed um, decisions. So uh, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of interest in the, in, in the, in the Cowichan region, as small geographically as it is, it's very uh, diverse and, and with, with lots of different interests and different challenges. And uh, the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Service provides that venue now for us to be able to bring those perspectives together uh, when we're making decisions and, and planning for the future. Um, wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Brian, I want to, uh, you know, I know you're, you've taken a, a considerable amount of time to, to prepare and, and be with us tonight. Um, you're coming to us from, from a fairly far distance away. So I really want to thank you for the time you've put into preparing this, being with us and, and sharing your thoughts and to also congratulate you on, on the, the really good and innovative work you did at County Valley when you're there. So um, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, um, It's uh, once again, it's been just an incredible pleasure to every time I get a chance to, to meet and speak with you, 
Um, I, I'm inspired. I, I can see all of these different ways of doing things. And so what I'd like to do is, is, is uh, give you the last word, and then I'm going to, to close the session off and, and give people a few of the details on, on what might happen next. I'd just like to thank the people that uh, took time from their their busy lives to to join us, and mm -hmm. uh, and the education is such an important ethic of of uh, the people that I work with in the partnership of, of Brian and Richard and and of Indigenous people as well. That educating ourselves and seeking new new ways of thinking is 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 uh, very important, and I just thank the people. That have joined us tonight um, because uh by you joining that just helps me uh, build my hope so uh, that's the first point i'd like to make um i'd like to encourage each person to to do their own individual sensing the spirit ceremony just going to the water going to nature sensing the spirit around you just embracing that it's a very simple but powerful thing uh, in, in the Gitsan Nation, like I said, we have that that uh, satuch, which was the conscious decision each day to make ceremony with nature, uh, to seek the joy of nature, and that will 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 help us um, along our way. And 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 I do see strength in in collaborating by interweaving Western science with with indigenous knowledge, because we need everyone at at the oars paddling together to solve this incredibly big problem but there it starts locally and uh yeah those are my final words so thank thank you everybody thank you uh, i, I want to quickly acknowledge the nalt paul chapman in particular the partnership for water sustainability for pulling all of this together uh, I want to let the audience know that if they have colleagues, friends, uh, acquaintances that feel there would be a lot of value in, in watching the session, it will be rebroadcast and on one of the media outlets uh, shortly after we deal with the post-production stuff, so you haven't missed everything. Um, so once again, on behalf of NALT, the partnership, uh, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. Be safe and um, enjoy the rest of your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.